the other day, recently, I was, I was reading a, a blog. It was on the OpenShift blog. Um, Matthias Schulig, a Kubernetes engineer, he said something like, it's almost become boring to say that Kubernetes has become boring, which is kind of interesting to hear that quote because I use Kubernetes and I don't find it boring at all. So when we talk about Kubernetes, we find that there is different type of users of the platform. There is developers. Um, with developers, I mean those developers that create the applications that run on the platform. Business application developers, developers that work at usually customers that have Kubernetes clusters up and running. They create value business applications. They don't know much about the platform itself. In fact, they even don't care about the platform itself. Whether, where their applications are running is not a problem for them. The thing is that they care about the code that they are creating for those applications. There is a second type of users. These guys, the operation guys, they don't really care that much about the applications themselves. What they care about is how the applications are running on the clusters. They need to know, they need to care that the application is up and running always. If there is a problem, they will need to solve the problem. If there is a problem, a specific problem with the application, they probably will call the application developers team to help them out with why the application is not working. But usually they will, make, they will take care of everything until they figure out the problem is by the application. So if, if something happens with the application, whether it needs more memory, CPU, this kind of stuff, this will be the guys that deal with Kubernetes and the applications. These guys, they know a lot, probably a lot, a lot about Kubernetes. They understand how Kubernetes resource descriptor works. There's all these YAML files that Kubernetes brings to our life, but they don't know about probably Java development or the applications themselves. And then there is a third type of users, which I call the Kubernetes ecosystem engineers. These guys, they are developers because they create Kubernetes or tools around the Kubernetes ecosystem. They develop applications, but they develop applications not usually not that will run on the Kubernetes cluster, or if they will run on the Kubernetes cluster will be part of the inner working of the Kubernetes cluster. But they are not the other type of developers. And there is a huge disconnect. There is a huge difference between what ones uh, developers, one developers need and understand from the platform from the, different, the other type of developers. So I think that these Kubernetes ecosystem engineers, they are like yogis that uh, float over the air, that they think they know anything that any user from Kubernetes, any Kubernetes user will need. And because they think they understand every Kubernetes user, what they are doing is they are providing the tools for those Kubernetes users. But those tools that they are producing, they are biased because how they work. Okay? So I think that there is a huge disconnect from the tools that these guys are producing to the tools that the other guys, the developers, need. There is a huge disconnect. Sometimes, as a developer, even though there is a disconnect, because we are only given uh, with some tools, we eventually need to learn some of those. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the process of developing applications on Kubernetes platforms, some of the tools that we are given, some of the pros and cons of those uh, tools, how they, how they can um, enhance our productivity as developers, and I will give at the end some conclusions about how things should evolve eventually, hopefully. And those uh, Kubernetes ecosystem engineers should take note and make some changes into what they are giving us. By the way, I'm, my name is Jorge Morales. I come from Spain. I used to be a Red Hat OpenShift uh, developer advocate, not anymore. As you saw maybe in the intro slide, I went to the other side, to the dark side. So I work for VMware right now. That's why I don't focus on OpenShift. I don't say anything about OpenShift. I'm sorry. I know this is a Red Hat, basically, conference. So before we start with, um, or, or as we speak, 
through what developers need uh, in the develop, uh, whenever it comes to developing applications. I use a triangle model to illustrate three different concepts, three different angles of things that are important to developing applications. But before we start with that, with the triangle, let's go through some definitions. So we can set the ground rules about what I say when we talk about applications. First one, first definition has to be an application. What do we consider an application? If I ask each one of you, probably you will give me a different definition of what an application is. How do you understand, how do you identify what an application is? If we look into some applications, we can start with one single process, binary, running in isolation. All the logic is built into that binary. So this is an application. Of course, it's an application. It's what we used to call a monolith, a monolithic applications. Sometimes these monolithic applications are not just one single binary, but multiple binaries. But they are so bind together, so co cohesively developed that they cannot work in isolation. So these two components are also an application. Or they can be seen as two different applications. Depends on each and every one. If we use storage, if we use a database, we would consider that the database is also part of your application. When you give, when you say to somebody, hey, install my applications, do you want him to have that database available? Or if it has multiple different components, multiple different databases, uh, <coughs> queues, external services, is that also part of your application? Would you consider that part of your application? And when you go into the microservices where there is a huge myriad of different services that decompose into individual, fun individual uh, functionality, will you call each and every microservice an application by itself? Or will you call all of those together an application by itself? Depends. And what about when we go, go into functions? Are the functions part of your application? If my application requires a function to run, is it part? Should I be also considering it part? So to me, a definition of application is any software component or a group of components that is designed for the end user. And what I mean with this, it's four things. It is complete. It is fully functional. That means that whatever I consider my application, it needs to run. If it requires something else, then I think that something is missing. So I need something more to consider my application. It does have to have versioning. So when I work on an application, I will probably work on it, evolve my application, provide more functionality. I need to be able to identify those multiple different versions. And this is important because at the end of the day, if I identify my application in some way, I want to have a version number for my complete application. Whether that application internally is using different components and will have different versioning numbers, that's OK. But the whole will need to have also a versioning number. There can be multiple instances of my application running with different configuration. Why? Because I might need to install my application multiple times, maybe in different environments, maybe in my laptop, multiple applications for doing different things. For example, I might have email, but email I might have it with different accounts. So that is the same application configured with different configuration. That's something that is required, in my opinion, for to consider a whole application. And then the last thing is that it can be easily installed. So if I consider my application to be this specific set of components and, and uh, configuration, I need to be I need to have a way to have that easily installed and running. If it's impossible to install, then that to me, that's not an application. Second definition that I would uh, like to introduce to you, so we can set the ground rules. Logical versus physical deployment. What I understand by logical view of an application is how those different components that we have been talking about, they relate to each other. How, if there is two components, how they will interact whether the communication will happen through HTTP, the protocol that we'll use, how they will connect, if it requires maybe storage to save some files, how it will work. But then there is a different uh, view of your application, which is the physical view, which is how your application will be deployed into the platform, will be deployed, how it's set up. 
okay? Whether it will require a specific type of storage, whether it will require more or less memory, uh, this kind of stuff, how, how, if they will be in containers or in VMs, that is the physical view. So when we talk about developers, I think that we usually care about the logical view of an application. Operation guys usually care more about the physical view of the application, how things are deployed. And then the third concept that I want to introduce before we get into the, into the talk is what I see as the Kubernetes application physical view. Kubernetes is based on containers, so that means that your application, your source code, will be running as container images. So your application will be a set of images, might be one, might be multiple. If you have multiple components, each component might be a one, single, one, one image. Those components will be related and will be deployed in a specific way. So how your components, how your containers will be deployed, they are defined in Kubernetes via resource descriptors. A deployment, stateful set, all those kind of Kubernetes things that developers will usually don't care. Those are also part of the physical view. And then the third thing is the configuration, which makes it different from deployment to deployment, from environment to, the, to environment. So if I, I might have a set of container images with a set of uh, resource descriptors that I may, I may want to apply to different environments or maybe in the same environment with different configuration. So eventually what, they make, what it makes it different is the environment configuration. If you go back to my definition to application, there was the possibility to create multiple instances with different configuration. This is part of your application as well. Okay, so let's start with the triangle of um, Kubernetes application development uh, things. First one, application definition. How do we define an application in Kubernetes? Okay. Some time ago, well, Kubernetes has been here for more than four years. For, many, for some years, there was no way to define an application. Initially, somebody, after some time, he said, let's add a label to your deployment saying app equals whatever, and it will say this is my application. But that wasn't enough. So the Kubernetes community, they came up with a bright idea of saying, let's expand those labels, not to be just app, app equals whatever the name of your application will be, because that will not be sufficient. So they standardizing, they, they create a recommendation of application label, lab, labels that they are defined in the Kubernetes documentation. So whenever you create your application, you should provide all these labels to your uh, labels, to your, to your descriptors. And not to the other, when I say to the, your descriptors, I mean to each and every descriptor. That means that if you are deploying what you consider an application, which is, uh, which is maybe a, let's say, a simple application, microservices application in Kubernetes, that will be the physical deployment will be the service, the ingress, the deployment, and all of those. So you need to add the, all of these labels to all those services so you can understand how uh, they are related. But this is a recommendation, and this means that it is up to you whether you stick to this or not, and is it up to the tool creators, those Kubernetes ecosystem engineers, to give us the tooling to have this in place and enforce this some way. There was a, an extension to this. Uh, there, there is a SIG applications. The SIG is a special interest group where all some uh, Kubernetes engineers, ecosystem engineers, they get together and they talk about a specific topic. So there is, there was, there is a SIG, a special interest group for applications, SIG apps. And those guys, they met together and they said, hey, now that we have the labels, let's maybe create an abstraction that will simplify the usage of those labels by the developers. So they created an additional, uh, what is called a CRD, con uh, Custom Resource Definition, which is an extension to Kubernetes that defines, provides a new descriptor to Kubernetes saying, hey, my application is this. So you now have an, an additional definition. 
So here you can see that you have a Kubernetes uh, with some application with some name, but then here you have a set of resources that will be added to your application. This relies on the application labels that we have seen in the previous slide. So that means that you still need to have all those labels. You need to make them working. This was a mess, and nobody uses this. So, uh, there is, a, there is a, another way, different way of defining applications, which is, has become more popular by the operators that um, Red Hat um, promotes, which is defining an application as a custom CRD. The same way as before, there was a generic custom CRD for applications. Now what we can have is a specific custom CRD for your application. So if you consider your application to be an HCD cluster, no matter what will be the physical and the logical view, you can define here easily that you need a cluster with the configuration that you will require, and under the hood, everything that will be required for the logical and the physical view would happen under. So for you, this is, for users, this is really good way of describing applications. But the problem is that these CRDs require a controller behind the scenes to make, to translate from this specific definition of your application to the real physical view of your application. So deploying everything that, that will require for your application to be running on the cluster. That custom controller is something that is not really easy to do. And you would not expect any developer to create any of this. So this is really used mostly for common off the shelf software. So if you go, if you want to use software that somebody is providing on ISV, so a database, um, uh, um, clustering or messaging technology or uh, CI CD tooling, you may be able to deploy that software out of the box via this way, custom CRD. So this is nice. And these descriptors can sometimes be integrated with your logic. If your application is using an, if your application is using a database, you can have this descriptor as part of your application definition. Uh, another um, effort to standardize or to come with an application definition application uh, into Kubernetes world is Cina. Cina is container native application bundles. Container, container native application bundles is a specification for packaging distributed applications. This, is, uh, this was initiated by Docker and Microsoft. And the specification, what it does is it says, hey, if you look into what I was telling before about the physical view, the images, the descriptors, and the configuration, if that is my application and I want to provide an easy way for somebody to install it, and I want, when I have applications, I might, be, I might want to distribute my applications to people, why not bundle all of that, all of that together into one single file, which is the bundle itself, that has the images, has the descriptors, has the configuration, and it's also overridable. So you, whenever you deploy it, whenever you create an instance of that bundle, you can say, hey, but for me, use this other configuration. So right now, you, can, you have one way of, uh, of identifying or, or seeing an application. But this is, this is, again, really easy for common of the shelf applications. But whenever it comes to creating uh, applications using Synapse, it's not that easy. The tooling is not really mature. And the problem is that Microsoft and Docker are the only companies working in, in Synapse. So right now, um, it's not uh, really standard. And then the last effort that I know of, which is interesting, is the OAM, all Open Application Model. The Open Application Model is a, um, it's an abstract definition to create um, to define applications again, but it's OAM is not specific to Kubernetes. It's an uh, application modeling that can be used for anything, any type of applications, no matter where they run, if they are on, uh, running on VMs or any other technology. One nice thing about OAM is that it understands that usually there is three different type of people involved into the application process. The application developers, which creates the application, so they will be focusing on providing only the application definition itself. 
the application operations, which says, hey, your application, the application image that somebody has created will be deployed in this way, and with this configuration. So these guys will, will or in this, in this model, these are the guys responsible for some different configuration by instance of your application. And then the infra guys. The infra guys, what they are doing is providing capabilities to the platform. So if we look into an example implement, the example implementation for Kubernetes, which is called Ruder. This is the implementation of the open application model. There is two different set of files. This is the developer focus file, the component schematic, and this is the, the application operations specific file. So in this file, the developer, what it says is, hey, I have a workload type. Whether I wanted to run it as a single server, singleton server is just one single instance of my application, or maybe a, a server, a regular server. So there is a set of uh, workload types defined in the specification, and you can customize. That means that you can create your own topology of your applications. And then you provide the parameterization that will have your application. So this is like creating a custom definition for your application, but in, in a generic way. Then the application operations guys, what we'll do is define how that application will be deployed. So the configuration that the, sch the component the schema schematic will have whenever it gets deployed. So developers, they do these files. Operations guys, they do these files. There is a separation of concerns, which at the end is nice. Okay? And depending on the capabilities that you have on the platform, you may be able to, to configure or to provide different capabilities to the platform. Second angle on the triangle of application Kubernetes application development. Application development stages. What I mean with this is when we develop applications, we go through different cycle of things typically to make them happen. So as developers, we author the code, so we create the application itself. No JS, Perl, Python, Java, of course. Then, in Kubernetes world, we create some descriptors, the deployment descriptors. Sadly, we have to do them because there is no way, no easy way for something to generate them for us. Packaging, that means that our application, maybe the application plus the descriptors need to be bundled. So if we look into, bundle, into packaging, can be just creating the Docker file or can be creating a, a Synap bundle. And then deployment. Deployment is applying that, the, those definitions plus the application into the cluster. So these are the different stages. Once you do go through all this cycle, you have the application. And you repeat that through the cycle of your application development. You change some, you might change one of these. You may touch one of, or one stage or not. But these are the four or five stages that you typically will go through when you are creating an application. OK. There is a set of tools that help us with all those uh, stages. There is many, many more. These ones are the ones that I find somehow useful. OK. Uh, they provide different functionality on, this, on the different stages. So if we look into this. These third, first three, they are just helpers to, when it comes to development. And I will, I will show them because I use them on the UI, and you will see them in the UI. These ones, they, help on the, they can help on the deployment phase, on the packaging phase. These ones help on the packaging phase, creating your applications. On the authoring phase, build packs and source to image. They help you in the authoring phase. So I'm going to do some demos of some of them, but then I will get into more details of one of them, which I really find pretty useful, which is this one, uh, K14S, Kubernetes Tools. And you will, you will see why I like it. OK. I need to see it for a while. So initially, I'm not going to show many of these because I have uh, more demos at the end for the third uh, angle of the triangle. Can you see my screen? Well, you need it to be bigger. Yes? No?
Okay. So one thing that you can see here is I have Minikube installed. Minikube is a local, uh, local Kubernetes cluster running on my, on my laptop. This is really handy for development, although it's not uh, really targeted for developers, but uh, developers would will, will, will want Minikube to have more developer capabilities. One of the things that you see here also is that I have in my prompt the name of the cluster that I'm connected and the namespace that I'm connected. Why? Because I think this is really important to understand as a user where you are doing your stuff. Why? Because most of the tools works in context. That means that they will do things to whichever cluster and whichever namespace you are connected. So it is wise, you typically, to know to which cluster and to which namespace you are connected. Okay? Um, so let's just start with Jim. Jim is a, we go to, Jim uh, is a tool that is mainly for, for developer, for Java developers. Well, it's uh, only for Java developers, I would say. But it has a, has a nice concept in it, this one. There is this, it integrates with Maven, with Gradle, so that you can build your application images on your laptop. The thing is, your containers are Docker files, are Docker images. So that means that you require Docker. Why would I require Docker if eventually at the end of the day, what really is a Docker image is a tar file? So JIP, what it does is, it creates a Docker image without having Docker in your laptop. So I don't need to have Docker. So that means that I can easily plug this into any, into any operating system, into any laptop. I don't require Docker. Docker, it's up your CPU and memory. But I still can, as a developer, as a Java developer, I can still build images. So let's uh, just build one image. And it integrates into your, into your uh, Maven developer workflow. So I can do Maven compile, yeah, build. So here we can see the output. What happened is I compiled my application and then it used a Docker file that I have in my application and packaged it and pushed it into a registry without interacting with Docker, which is pretty neat. Another thing that does Jim, which is quite interesting, is that it can, whenever it comes to create the Docker layers, which is how your stuff will be put into the container images, it has some intelligence, so it will try to create the layers in the most optimal way. So your application dependencies are put into one layer, and then your application code is put into a different layer. So when you change the code, the only layer that it will change is the last layer. So the pushes to the registry will be pretty fast, the builds will be pretty fast, and the, the, the pushes will also be minimal in size. So this is really nice tool whenever it comes to integrate or to, to work with, uh, with uh, Java. And then I'm going to show you Helm, which is a very popular framework, which is Helm. Uh, I'm going to create a namespace. So again, because I, wa I don't want, as a developer, I don't want to, miss, to mix everything into one single namespace, into one single project, because uh, eventually, if I try to deploy similar stuff, they might, there might be interferences. One thing that I do is I use different namespaces to each and every application or each and every application that I'm trying, that I'm, that I'm doing. So Helm, it's a CCS. Well, let's, let's look into the Helm uh, definition. This is Helm. What it does is provide a packaging and a template format. So when you have an application defined with all the descriptors, what you can do is make it parameterizable. So you can provide different configuration for every time that you want to instantiate that application in the cluster. It's not used in the build process. 
in the image authoring, it's only, it's only used on the, deployment, on the deployment phase. So whenever you are deploying your application, you can deploy it with Helm. There is a, there is a, this, this is one of the most common ways of packaging your application, although I think it's pretty weak. Uh, although the new release is better than the previous one, Helm 3 is, is much better. But it's really weak because it uses text templating. So that means that if I have a typo on my, on my template, I will not know, uh, Helm will not know why it's not working. It will just tell me, hey, I couldn't do anything, but I don't, I don't give you a hint of where the problem is. So let's uh, look into, for example, I have a chart. Let's do, for example, one of these typos. If I do Helm install, uh, let's give it an application, hello world. And let's say that I want to deploy a chart that is based here. What I get is, hey, this is not allowed. But it's giving me line 29 of something that I don't even know. Deployment. As you can see, there is, is line 23. There is no 29 lines. So it's not really helpful. So if I undo the typo, I can just install my application. And it didn't install. What did it install? I don't know. How did it install? I don't know. If it's running, I don't know. It just allowed me to install stuff. As you can see in the templating language, you can provide configuration. So I could say Helm install whatever minus set, uh, uh, let's say service.port or replica set, which is easy. Replica count. If I try to do this, it will tell me, hey, hey, you already have an application. The name is already in use. So it, it also doesn't allow me to update my application if I have it running. So if I change the value, you have to uninstall your application and install it again. So I can do help install help. I'll uninstall Hello World, and then install it with replica count of two, and then I will succeed. As you can see, this has become really popular because it was a way of packaging your applications, but it's not really powerful. So, sorry. As I said, I'm not an OpenShift anymore, so I don't know. But yes, it will work. <laughs> Because I read the blogs and it's, they said that, or the tweets, and they said that uh, it will work. Although I think it's a poor decision to go with them. I mean, not a poor decision because there is a lot of charts, but I think that as tooling is not the best tooling. So, going, continuing with my presentation, this is the tool that I like, K14S. This tools is a set of different tools that provide simple commands that are composable. What this means for simple commands is that there is one command for each and every specific task that you have on the development stages. So there is a tool for templating and overlaying. There is a tool for building. There is a tool for deploying. So you can do something like deploy my application with a simple command. Let's. Uh, Let's do that. OK, so let's go to to K14S. And I have here, I have, an, uh, I have a deployment, a regular deployment. This is, this is just the definitions, the Kubernetes plane definitions. So I will typically do something like kubectl apply minus f and this file. When I do that, it gets applied. I don't know what's happening. I don't know. I, I only get, a, as a result, I only get a, an indication of the resources that have been created. Whether there is something that's changing, how they are creating, it doesn't give me the option to say, hey, this is really what I want to do. <laughs> so with, with KAP, with KAP, uh, I can do KAP deploy. You have to give it a name, okay? So let's call it Hello World. 
and I will say minus f, uh, uh, step one. Boom. It told me, it connected to the cluster, it said, hey, you're going to try to deploy these resources. This is a plan, an ingress, a service, and I'm going to update it because they don't, they don't exist. OK? You want to go with them or not? I can say yes, no. OK, let's deploy it. Oh, we're in the namespace helm. And because, as I said, because we're using the same names, I, I'm using the same example for all, the, all of them. Um, I had a, I, I had run into problems. So, k create namespace k14s, k namespace k14s, and this this thing that I did, which is select the namespace, this this one is a plugin. This is not built into the kubectl uh, uh, command line by default because they don't care about developers. This is something that we do quite often but they are fine with minus n for every single command that they execute. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do the same. Okay, so now I'm deploying my application and everything is done. And by default, it will wait for your application to be deployed, which is quite nice because when it's deploying, it's giving you information of how things are progressing, and if something failed, you get, a, you get a, an indication of how it failed. There is a couple of nice commands to kapp, which gives you a lot of interesting information. So this one, it's an inspect of my application. So inspect of my application, what is saying, hey, I'm, a, I'm inspecting the application here that I just deployed as a tree. So it's telling me, hey, there is a deployment that KIA created, so you, and then the cluster created a replica set and a pod for you. The instance, the, the, the edge. So this information is quite useful for us to understand and to see. And then there is also, of course, KIA list that will give you a list of applications that you have. So uh, event, uh, under the hood, what it does KIA is it adds some annotations and, and to your deployments. But those annotations are quite handy for us, plain mortals, mere mortals, whenever we are using the, 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 a platform that we don't understand. Okay. So, as I said, these are composable tools. So we can have a, a, a tool that will do a templating that can, the template that you create can be fed into the deployment. So I can, I can process my template, and the result can be fed into the application deployment. So that tool is called YTT. YTT, it's a, in this case, what I have is the same deployment defined, but now it's using a templating language. And it's not a poor templating language like the one used in, in Helm. It is a stronger uh, templating language that it understands because it uses object uh, templating instead of text templating. So at the end, what I'm doing is just externalizing some values to a, to a file. So I have two different files, the one with the configuration and the one with the template, so I can materialize that. So let me copy the commands so we can go a little bit fast. So I'm going to execute this command, which uh, what it does is it processes the template. So what I'm doing here is I'm processing the template as it is. I'm fading it to, to Kaya. And it's telling me, tell me the changes, OK? Because I didn't change anything. I'm using just the same template, which is equivalent. There is no changes, so there is nothing to be applied to the cluster. But what if I say, let's use a, let's use a configuration change. So let's try to instantiate your application. But this time, I will give to the ingress route a different value. Now, let's uh, make this bigger. One nice thing is that because I provided these changes, it's telling me, hey, this is the minus is what's in the cluster. This is what you are, what you are going to be applying. And then it's going to change only this resource 
despite you have you are giving me all of them, the only one that's going to change is this one, whether you want to proceed or not. And then there is giving me an error, mostly because because I'm chaining commands and it's expecting the answer to this command uh, as a standard in, so it's giving error. So in order to apply this command, I will need to provide the minus one to this one, and now I have I have my my chains in the cluster. Okay, uh, but not only that, you can also have overlays. W what are overlays? Overlays is that you can have different configuration, even though you have the same uh, definitions. You, you, you don't want to change and to provide all of the same whole configuration files again and again. What, I, what you do with overlays is this is the set of my main configuration, and I just want you to change one specific part of that configuration. That's an overlay. So with this overlay, what I'm saying is whenever you deploy this, just change in the deployment, change the replicas to three. So if I, if I apply this overlay, it will give me it will give me the changes that are happening. It will tell me two changes because we changed the ingress. That's the change because it's reverting back to the previous value that I had. And it's telling me also the replicas because I'm changing the replicas with the overlay. And then we can even customize this or, or change this more to building images. We developers usually build the images and we need to push them into registries and whatnot and use the image references and we need to change the, the configuration files of the Kubernetes resources with the scriptors. So kbuild, uh, which is right here in the middle, kbuild, it's a tool that will change the images that you have in deployment the descriptors based on a set of rules which are really easy to find. So you can say, hey, whenever you find my descriptor with let's say this image, change it with it, this other one. And by the way, if this other one happens to be something that I want to be locally, just build it locally. So let's go with an, an example of that. Uh, I'm going to do the full example because uh, we're getting out of time. What it, is, what it did is kapp, so this is the command that I executed. What it did is created YTT, created the definition of the, the, the descriptors, and then it provided those definitions to kbuild to build the images. And then whenever those images, and well, those descriptors with the images and everything was, was provided, it deployed that into a cluster. And I'm using, in this example, I'm using an additional, additional descriptors, two additional descriptors. One of them is telling the sources. So what it's saying is, hey, whenever you find an image which is based on Octeto, Hello World, Golang, just think that it is in my path, in that path. So do a Docker build using that as a, as a context. And it will create an image. And that image that it will create, then uh, with this other file, what it does is image destinations is whenever you find that image, push it to the cluster to whatever uh, repository you have defined in the cluster, which I have defined in the value YAML. I have my local registry of my mini in my mini cube. So what it did is it built the image. It pushed it to my internal Docker registry and it created the deployment. And the good thing, if we look into the, into the, into the differences that it creates, is that it annotates the descriptor with, hey, the image that you were trying to do, uh, somewhere, I'm missing a line. Well, the image that you are going to use is this one. Uh, and the path that it's going to use for building is this other one. Uh, 
that uh, repository that is using. So if we look into the image that it uses, is it uses this image. Let me copy the right command because I think I, I did execute. So there is an option, I didn't, I didn't add it in the demo, there is an option that it, it, it tells you, hey, whenever you build this image, push it to my internal registry. So the, internal regist the image will be pushed into the internal registry. Whenever you see, whenever you see this command, you should see, oh, it's, it is being pushed. So it is pushed to the internal registry, okay? So this, these tools, they are quite handy for, for developers. Let's move on. The third, uh, the third angle of the application development phases or the application development in Kubernetes is inner loop versus outer loop. We developers, we know that there is what we usually do, it's called the inner loop. So it's we build, we code our application, we build it, and we test it locally usually multiple times every day. Whenever we're ready for that, what we do is we push that code into a Git repository, and then what it happens is that there is an outer loop what we usually call the continuous integration, where that's automated, that's real continuous integration of somebody doing the same process of delivering or deploying your application into multiple environments, that's the outer loop. In the outer loop, developers are not usually not involved. In the inner loop, we are involved. We are totally involved. So this is the cycle that we want. So one thing that we want is we, this loop really, when we do it in our laptop, it's really fast. That means that we code, we build, we test multiple times. It's really easy. When it comes to containers, there is additional steps that happen in the inner loop, like building images, pushing to registries, pulling from registries. And that is really, can be really slow. So what we developers, we want is the control safe functionality ready to test in the Kubernetes clusters. So we want, developers want a fast inner loop. How is this implemented? So usually there is, uh, there is tools that what they do is they have a deployment or you do the, your deployment on the, on the cluster and then it synchronizes your local file system with the, with, the, with the pods that are running on the cluster in many different ways. Every tool does it differently. And every time you change something, it, will, it might rebuild your application. Maybe through, a, through a building your image or not building the image. That depends on the tool. So there is a set of tools that serve the purpose of the inner loop. Octeto, garden, tilt, scaffold, dev space, and OpenShift Auto that is right in the corner, mostly because it's OpenShift specific. Hopefully not someday it will not be OpenShift specific, but right now it only works on OpenShift, so it's not really considered. So being conscious, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, I, I had demos for all of these tools, but I will, I will just uh, do a couple of them. Uh, so. so let's show dev space, which is one of that I like. I like it a lot. Uh, I will leave the QA for later. Uh, no, yes, there is some later outside. Uh, CD dev space. So here in DevSpace, I have again the same application. And these tools, what they do is they define, uh, they define specific descriptor. So whether that's uh, DevSpace, Tilt, uh, Garden, Auto, they have a specific descriptor that, that says, hey, how the tool will interact, how I will deploy things, uh, what should I do, the ports that I should put forward. So here we can do just uh, Dev space. Uh, let me see because I, dev space is specific. You need to create an empty space. Okay, uh, I'm gonna use that name space. When you do dev space deploy, what is what it happens is that it will deploy your application. So if you don't specify anything in the descriptor, it will use an, an internally generated Helm chart. But you can use kubectl commands or plain Kubernetes descriptors. You can use a scaffold. You can use um, 
You can use uh, customize. You can use many different ways to deploy it. So the tool is really flexible. That's why one of the things that I like it. And then once you have done that, it gives you some of the commands that you will use as a, as a user. So, hey, you want to connect to your application. I just deployed it. I want to connect it. How do I do it? OK, it gives you inter in an interactive way. It asks you to how you want to connect. I want to connect via an ingress. OK, so let's say uh, dev space dot test. And it's creating the ingress, and it's connecting to my application. So it's doing a lot of stuff that I shouldn't need to do. Because as a developer, I don't know how to create an ingress, most likely. So this kind of stuff is taken away from me. Um, and another thing that it does, which is really useful, is dev space open, which, uh, no, not open, sorry, dev space there. Which is configuring your environment for local development. So it's doing a lot of stuff. It's, uh, again, opening my application uh, on, a, on a local. This time it's using port forwarding for development. But the good thing is I have my, my application here. I can just go to Hello World. Uh, if I control save, we see that automatically this have built the application and started the application, and it was pretty fast. I have my application, and you, get, you, you saw how long did it take to do all of that. It was instantly. So this is, this is the kind of workflow that developers like whenever they are interacting and creating applications on, on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the other one, Tilt, or yeah, Tilt which uh, provides similar workflow. But uh, but it does something more, which is it has a graphical UI as well to help you with it. So everything that happens, you get an indication in a graphical view. Uh, you can access your, your service and everything. And in fact, well, Garden, it does also similar stuff. It does provide a UI. So you can also configure it so you, every time you save, it will rebuild and redeploy your application. It has a UI, and it's uh, really nice. Let's go with the three slides that I have. Uh, so my conclusions are, there is simple tools and power tools. Power tools does a lot of things. Simple tools does just one specific task. But sometimes using simple tools is really nice to get started to understand what is going on. And the fact that Kubernetes, the Kubernetes tools does help with chaining those simple tools is really useful because at the end you get the power tools uh, functionality with the simple tools. Problem with simple tools is, or power tools is that sometimes there is so many commands, so many configurations that they are really difficult to understand. Do we want we do to happen here? Well, sometimes we are developers. We don't care about the platform. Yes, we do want we do. But we also, some of the people that uses the tools which are, uh, will be using them, they want to understand what's going on. So it's, uh, it's usually it's good to select a set of tools that allows you, lets you understand what's going on, but at the same, day, at the same time, it gives you an abstraction of how they work. Consistency as a future. We need to think that whenever we create applications, they go through the inner loop and then the outer loop. So it will be ideal to have the same tools that can be used for the inner loop and the outer loop. So we decide to be deploying applications with KApp and with the scriptors or use YTT. It will be awesome whenever we create our workflow of developing applications in, in, our, in our company to use the same tools throughout the whole chain. Because then it will be easier for us to manage and to know what's going on. And to finish, there is a quote from the future that says, remember the quote initially, that's become boring to say Kubernetes is boring. So my quote is, 
it's almost become boring to say that developing applications on Kubernetes has become easy, which is not today. Okay, with that, there is a link to the slides, to the repos, and there is no time for Q&A. Thank you very much. <laughs>